number 200 in your hymn books this evening. 200, make me a blessing. Number 200, make me a blessing. You may remain seated as we sing. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Make me a blessing, make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine, make me a blessing, O oh, Savior, I pray. sweet story of Christ and his love. Tell of his power to forgive. Others will trust him if only you prove true every moment you live. Make me a blessing Make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O oh, Savior, I pray. was given to you in your need. Love as the master loved you. Be to the helpless a helper indeed. Unto your mission be true. Make me a blessing Make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O oh, Savior, I pray. you need to turn really far, really, really far, one page over to 201. More about Jesus. 201. Sing it together. More about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn more this holy will discern spirit of god my teacher be showing the things of christ to me more more about jesus 
more, more about Jesus, more of His saving fullness see, more of His love who died for me, more about Jesus in His Word, holy communion with my Lord, hearing His voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more this saving fullness see, more of Pastor says one more song. All right, 202 then. 202, near to the heart of God. Sing it together. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us to wait before Thee near to sing? Amen. That's good. All right. Well, that was good this morning, huh? Good service and a good crowd of folks. Um, praise the Lord and a good message. And I was so glad that Chris came and got saved. We well, got saved in Sunday school, actually, but he came and so pray, pray for him. And, uh, and we keep trying to reach out. Amen. And now when the devil um, wants to discourage us, we need to be encouraged and encourage others and uh, keep looking for God to, uh, to give us some fruit. And uh, I know he will. Um, I, I really, uh, when, I, when I talked to uh, Brother Jim Rowe this week, he, he's really discouraged because he can't travel right now. Everything is shut down. And, um, you know, and you can't send money over to the island um, uh, in the usual way, they have to go around the bouts to get it done. 
So there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues, a lot of things going on. Um, you know, usually he would travel and then make arrangement for the funds. But uh, that's the kind of thing that missionaries are dealing with, um, not being able to be out of the house for more than so many hours a day. Uh, kids not in the schools and so forth. Um, it's, it's a lot worse in many places than it is here. So we need to pray much for our missionaries that they won't get discouraged. Just like I said this morning, you know, if you're in a holding pattern, you're still in the air. Don't come down. <laughs> don't don't uh, give up. And uh, so we need to pray for them. Okay, we're going to have a message first tonight, 2 Corinthians 7. And you guys can go sit down. And we'll call on you later, okay? All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. All right. It's always great to have visitors, too. And I'm always happy when you're well-behaved. You, you talk nice to people, you greet them. You will not believe how many people I've talked to that have come to this church that said, well, I went to another church, and nobody even, nobody even came up to shake my hand. Nobody even recognized that I was there. And uh, these are some churches that aren't bad churches, and I think, well, I praise the Lord. Um, hopefully after 31 years, we've been able to help you. Uh, the church was always friendly when we got here. And uh, it's even, you know, we've tried to build on that. Um, we, we need to make sure we don't get in our own little group, okay? Let's make sure that we expand. We're always looking to meet new people. Um, we want to pray for, continue to pray for the Shaver family tonight and also the Houston family that uh, God would be uh, close to them. Okay, and we're going to get some other things here in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> there's one other thing I wanted to mention to you. Oh, we had a suggestion um, that for a banquet, and we've been trying to find some ideas since we can't go to, the, you know, to a hall. Um, I've been looking around at some other places, haven't got any prices. I'm sure they're going to be pretty expensive if you rent out a banquet hall. But uh, it was suggested that instead we have like a, um, a couple's night pizza party and the game time. And um, I see some of you already saying pizza. <laughs> um, but some of you are saying pizza, right? So um, it's just a different idea um, was proposed to us. I kind of like the idea. It, uh, for one thing, Ladies don't have to do the cooking. What we can do is we can just charge you one price and uh, go ahead and buy the pizza and have it all here. And that way, yeah, that's the way to do it because that way people don't have to run around after work to pick it up. So um, the, we, we, and it's uniform that way. So that's our idea, anyhow. So anybody, anybody uh, game on that? I think that's good. <laughs> All right. What's that? Oh, it depends on where you're getting your pizza from. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we've been to just about every pizza place in town. Yeah. We swear by pizza to $5. Yeah. Yeah. There are other people that don't like CC's, so that's, that's one of the problems, finding the pizza that everybody loves. Okay, we're going to talk it over. That's, that was an idea that was thrown out there to us. I like the concept of it, no matter how, how we get the pizza here. Uh, we're just trying to take the pressure off of people um, coming over from work and so forth. But we will work it out, all right? And I know everybody's taste is different. Um, there are pizzas that I don't like. Uh, in my opinion, uh, Pizza Hut pizza is the best. But that's just my opinion. Actually, the best pizza is the one that gets made at home. And, um, hmm? How many people say amen to that? Okay, we can do that. You can bring your own. Then we can sample each other's wife's cooking, but that kind of takes away from the wife not having to cook the meal. Okay, that's what we're trying to get away from. Okay, that was the whole idea to have a, you know, to have a banquet. Okay, well, if you want to go work, go ahead and do it. Uh, at least you don't have to clean up, right? We can do that the next day. All right, it'll, it'll be easier to pick up pizza boxes. Well, if you, if you make your own, you bring it on a, you just take it home with you and wash it yourself. I don't care. You really want to do that. All right, 
we'll talk it over and we'll come up with a plan. Amen? Amen. All right, next we've got to have a night. All right, we've got to figure that out. Uh, what night to do it because people's work schedules are so crazy. So we're going to try and work all that out. All right. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And let's read verse 1. As I told you through this whole series, Paul is uh, defending uh, not only his uh, position as the apostle, um, but he's also, he's also trying to show the Corinthians that he really, you know, he cares about their spiritual growth. This first verse of chapter 7, remember chapter 6 was about, uh, chapter 5 and 6 was about the ministry that God had given to them. And in chapter 7, verse 1, he makes this conclusion. He says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Brother Dan, what would you do with the... Um, there it is, never mind. I got it. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. <clears throat> His conclusion is, our purpose is to live more holy. See what it says? Let us cleanse ourselves. Now you remember that the blood washes away the sin. Remember Jesus said in John 13 to his disciples, people that already believed in him, that they needed to wash their feet. In other words, we pick up the junk of this world every day. <clears throat> we need to wash, we need to have our feet washed. We need to have that cleansing. If you remember, in the, um, in the temple, the order in which you came to the different furniture, which represented different practices. The first thing you came to, what was the first thing you came to when you came to the temple or the tabernacle? What was the first piece of, of equipment there? No. It was the altar. The altar was first. Because the altar, without the blood, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. You, you don't come to the laver first and dip your hands. You come to the blood first and get washed with the blood. After the altar, after the sacrifice was made, the blood applied, you came to the laver of cleansing. And <clears throat> that's a picture of, well, that's a picture of the word of God, being washed with the word of God every day. And that's what we need in salvation. It's a picture um, from, um, <clears throat> from, uh, from the Old Testament, you know, from the, the, the uh, Israel when they came out of Egypt. And they went out into the wilderness, the first place they came to. Um, the first thing they did, they, they came to um, <clears throat> the waters of, of uh, um, what's the name of it, Meribah. And they were distressed there. And, you know, that water refreshed them. But this picture of the water, the next thing they came to, they, that God gave them after, the, after you know, the picture of, of coming out of it, it, Egypt was the Passover was salvation, the Red Sea is baptism, and then the next thing God did was give them uh, manna from heaven, which is a picture of the word of God. And we need, look, that's the first thing. We need the word of God to cleanse us um, every day. And without that application, well, what happens when you don't wash? That was the first thing everybody thought about, huh? Um, I often think about, you know, you watch some of these, uh, these movies from uh, ancient times or from medieval times, you know, and, or even from colonial times, and you think, I wonder what that smelled like, you know. That'll be a new sensation when they figure out from Hollywood how to, 
you have the odor come across the screen that you'll not be interested in watching anymore because it will not smell. Hey, the odor out of Hollywood is foul anyhow, as far as God's concerned. But <clears throat> the, the, when, the, when the dirt builds up, uh, <clears throat> the other day we um, had a vacuum cleaner here. That, and by the way, our vacuum cleaners, if you hear me say we bought another vacuum cleaner, it's because they get beat up here. Um, we try to take care of them, but uh, the other day Dan had to take uh, the one and dig all the, all the crud out from around the beater bar, and the little motor had quit working. Fortunately, it's under warranty, so we're, we're there sending us another one. But uh, all that crud got built up in there, and he had it in the office back there, and every time he'd move that thing, crud would fall out on the floor <laughs> and fall out in his hand and dirt. Why? Because it didn't get cleaned. You know, we need, look, your life will become like that, and my life will become like that. We need to be cleansed. Let us cleanse. Look, he doesn't say, have somebody else come and wash you. He says, let us cleanse ourselves. You need to get the word of God and let it work on you. Don't expect the preacher to do it. Don't expect your wife or husband to do it. Don't expect some some radio or TV personality to do it. You need to take the word of God yourself and apply it. Amen. And let it clean you up. Clean up your mind, clean up your heart, clean up your mouth. I threw that last one in there. We do need to clean up our mouth, don't we? Amen. So, this is the objective. He says, having this, these promises for this ministry, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Of all filthiness. Now, I was referring back to the end of chapter 6, which we didn't really look at on Wednesday night, where <clears throat> he challenges the Corinthians to be separate. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. How much we need to preach that today as much as in the first century. So that we don't get tied up in in situations where there's a difference, look, there's a different focus, there's a different goal. If you get, if you get in uh, to some kind of deal, I don't care what kind of a deal it is, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a business deal, um, <clears throat> whether it's just palling around in, in recreation, and you get tied up with other people in it, it's going to eventually, it's going to eventually lead you to a compromise, okay? Because that's where the world goes. It's trying to pull you down. Satan's trying to pull you down. Look, Paul didn't need to put this in there just, you know, God doesn't put it in there just to take up space. He's trying to warn us that we need to be careful about our associations, about our entanglements in the flesh. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what conquered hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are te the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. One of the things people don't want to hear today. Separate yourself. Now, isn't it funny? The world wants us to separate. Stay six feet apart. Amen? Social distancing. Did they read the book? <laughs> because you won't get contaminated. Preachers, Baptist preachers, Bible-believing preachers have been preaching it for years. Don't get contaminated. And people go, oh, you're crazy. But the world says, social distance. Wash your hands. Use sanitizer. Wear a mask. And they think they're, they're, they're great. And we're crazy for not wearing the mask now. And we're crazy if we don't social distance now. And we're crazy if we... Well, I don't think you're crazy if you don't wash your hands, amen? You need to do that anyhow. But think about it. Isn't that, isn't that weird? They're copying what we've been preaching for years. And they think it's good sense now. We always knew it was good sense. But you know what? That's just the physical. He's talking about the spiritual. 
to get tied up spiritually with the corrupt system. All right? <clears throat> back in um, back in the mid '60s, that's 1960s. Okay, I know I just went into another planet for some of you. I could tell the crowd's getting younger because when I talk about the '60s now, a lot of them just go, "Uh huh." Some of you actually relate to what I'm talking about, and the other ones go, "Uh huh." That's good. I'm glad the crowd is younger. Amen? Hey, hey folks, I was thinking about this. I, I've been introducing myself to yours as not the future of this church. Okay? You know why? Because at 72, I'm not the future of this church. Now, I am the president of this church. You say, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, I could bring these kids up here. They were raised here. They were Oriana's age, and Livy's age, and Carmela's age, and Ellie's age, and, and Elena's age, and Lexi's age, when they came to this church. How old did you say you were, Chris? You said you've been coming here 30, 30 years? You came when you were two, right? We don't say how old she was when she came. 30 years, she'd been coming to this church. Okay. Okay. These are what, this is, this is what the church is now. You folks who've come, okay, and been here for a while, 10, 15 years, that, that was what we did. We stayed fast. We, we preached the word. We tried to stay true Amen. to God's word. Try to teach you what God says. Try to help you, you know, through all the, the struggles and, and try to get you to grow. And now they're grown up. They've got little kids. Amen. Okay, there, you want to see the future of the church? There it is. That's the future of the church. It's what's coming through this door. Aren't you glad that even in a lockdown, there are young people coming to our doors? Amen. And that's what we need to see happening and continue to happen. But I'm not the future of this church, okay? I hope you all know that, right? You all knew that. You weren't naive and think that I'm going to outlive all of you. Number one, I don't want to do that. Number two, you're being totally unrealistic, okay? Number three, you'll get tired of hearing the same jokes if I'm here for 70 years, all right? Let's see, 70 years, 40, I've made 112. All right, anyhow, enough of that. But this is the message, be ye, look, come out from among them and be ye separate. We need to... <laughs> We need, to, we need to make sure spiritually. Back in the 60s. See, you forgot what I was talking about. Back in the 60s. Um, it actually happened before that. Actually, at the end of probably the 50s, there, there came a movement where some fundamentalists began to compromise. Their position started to work with other groups. Um, big campaigns for cities where you'd have the evangelist, and I think you know the name of the one I'm talking about, and he would have on his platform, he would have <clears throat> the heads of all the different denominations, okay? Methodist, Presbyterian. It didn't matter what their doctrinal position was. And they'd have the Catholic priest or bishop, all right? And if there's anybody else, I don't know if they ever had Mormons come and be part of that or not. Uh, you know, one of the dangers of the right to life movement is that there are a lot of other religious groups that are involved in it that aren't doctrinally the same as we are. We hold this commonality, and we need to make sure that we make the distinction, though, about why we stand where we do. And that we're not going to get... Look, you could start having all kinds of problems. I remember... Um, <clears throat> when someone wanted me to have sings with some of the more Pentecostal brethren, <laughs> wanted us to go and participate in their sings. Um, I, I, sorry, folks, we're not doing that. We're, you know, 
And some people say, well, you think you're going to be the only ones in heaven. No. I know there's going to be a lot of people there that are not part of Independent Baptists. There are a lot of people, I've met a lot of people saved in, out, of the, out of Catholicism. Some of them are still in the Catholic Church. I don't know why. But they have a clear profession about their salvation. I've met, I've met folks at every denomination. But they didn't get saved because of the program or because of the denomination, or because of the preaching. People get saved because of the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and convicts their hearts about salvation. Amen. Most of the people I ever met that got saved in Catholicism came out of Catholicism because they did what that verse says. They realized the fallacy in Catholicism, and so they left it. They came out from among it. Look, can you bring truth and error together? Hmm? What's going to happen? The error is going to contaminate the truth. It's so important that we hold true, hold fast. All right? And not just because it's a rule we have, it's because it's the word of God. It's an expression of who God is. It is the very, look, look Jesus Christ is who God is. And when we look at him in all his purity and holiness... That's what we want to be like. That's what we need to be like. And it's not because we have some rule we're trying to force on people. It's because we're trying to be more like Jesus and conform to the image of his son. That's the goal. That's what Paul was telling the Corinthians. That's what he meant when he wrote in his first letter to them. And he started, you know, he started pointing out things. But that was the point. Perfecting holiness. What's Peter say? He quotes Leviticus, be ye holy, for I am holy. Be set apart from sin. It's still the same message today, no matter what the world says out there. You know, so many people get saved now and don't think they need to change at all. That's why you have these being contemporary churches. Because the people, the whole philosophy, and I've heard this from people who have come out of those churches, that there's no... There's no teaching for growth that will tell them, look, you need to change. You need to be different. So, so this is the, the point of it. Now, did you, ever, did you ever have an issue that you had to deal with with someone? I mean, it was a problem. And there was something that was wrong and it needed to be corrected. And you wanted to, I mean, you had to, you had to take care of it. You had to... to, to confront either the person or the group and deal with the issue and you, you weren't sure how it was going to go. You weren't sure how they were going to take it. And you were like, oh man, I just don't know how this is going to go down. And you were concerned about what the reaction would be and what the response would be. Well, if you read chapter, well, you can read several chapters, but especially here in chapter 7, that's what Paul's talking about. How he was so concerned he wanted to, you know, his goal was to get them to be more like Jesus. And he was concerned because he had to deal, he had to, to, to speak directly to some issues that were very difficult. And he had to do it in strong terms. And he was worried that they would react against it. Because he didn't want to become their enemy. Hey, you know, parents when you have to react strongly to your children, you don't want them to become your enemies, right? You're always afraid they'll become your enemies because you deal with an issue. The truth is that if we do it with the right heart, hopefully they'll take it the right way. And Paul had the right heart in this because he, <clears throat> he talks about here now, let me just read through this quickly and I'll get to the last point and we'll be done. Receive us. We have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you. The word defraud there means to injure, do harm to. I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. You understand how much we really care about you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. Uh, well, that sounds weird, but he was. You know, a lot of times you're really glad for people. He was happy for what, had, what they had accomplished in Corinth. Think about it. In 
the Hollywood of the day, all right, cesspool of iniquity, uh, the center of idol one of the centers of idolatry in, in, in that time, uh, they, had, they had carved out a great work for God. And there were a lot of people being saved. And there were people being made right with God. But there were some things they had to deal with. But he said, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really proud of you. I'm really pleased with what I've seen. Um, and I, I speak not this to condemn you, okay? But because, you know, our hearts are with you to die and to live with you. We really care about you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulations. For when we were coming to Macedonia... Our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within were fears. In other words, you know, I wrote that letter, and then I, I kept thinking about it, and I didn't hear from you. Uh, you know, they couldn't just text him or send an email, right? They had to send the messenger down. He had to send Titus. Titus was a young preacher. That he said, you know, Titus, I can't go down there myself right now, but I've got to have somebody because I've got to know what happened. When they delivered the message... What did they do? Did they say, oh, it's a bunch of bunk and throw it in a trash can? Or did they, did, did they just say, well, you know, we don't care what he says? Or did they get on their knees and start praying to God and, and, and start repenting and start changing things? What happened there? I just, I can't hardly stand it. I mean, that's what he's saying in here. He said, without were fightings, within were fears. We, we, we had all kind of uh, uh, opposition already, and now... You know, we're, we're trying to, to work on, but we had fear. Hey, did you ever have fear on in the inside because you weren't sure what was going on with somebody that you really loved? There's people in this room. That's where you are tonight. We've been there with people that you really love. And you say, well, we're trying to... We're trying to tell them what's God's word, trying to encourage them, trying to do the right thing. We don't know where it's going. He said, nevertheless, God that comforted, verse 6, nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. So we kept Titus down there, and, and he came back, and he, he said he gave us this report, not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoice the more. In other words, when they got the message, they said, oh, Paul says this is wrong. Well, boy, we need to change it. Boy, we need to do something. I, what, what, we didn't realize, and now he's corrected us. Boy, don't you wish your kids would do that? Amen. Sometimes they do. Amen? The prayer is that, that they'll realize what the Corinthians realized, that Paul wasn't talking down to them. He wasn't trying to boss them around. He wasn't trying to run their lives. He was giving them God's truth to try to keep them on the right track. That's what we do. And we don't know how people will respond to it. We don't know what they'll say to it. We pray that the Spirit of God would cause their heart to be tender. You see, there's a lot of us invested. Our life, our time, our energy, our desire to see God do something in someone's life. It's heartbreaking when we see people choose to go the other way. You know, one of the things about being a preacher Sometimes tell people that they don't like what you tell them, even though it's truth. And you're just trying to warn them and you love them. And sometimes they don't react very well. And you warn them and then it happens the way you said 
And you could come and say, well, I told you so. You know, it's no fun to say I told you so. When you see broken hearts and broken lives. And people make big mistakes in their life. When all you're trying to do is <laughs> just warn them. Just tell them, hey, this is, the, this is God's way. This is the way of holiness. Not that, you're the perfect, that I'm the perfect example of it. But I know somebody who is. And we keep trying to point you to Jesus. And that's what Paul was saying here about the Corinthians. That he loved them. And he was so glad that they responded in a positive way. Now I want you to notice something here. And I'll finish with this tonight, this last half. He says, for though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent. In other words, I'm not changing my mind about what I said, even though it made you sorry for what you did and the attitude you have and what you were doing that was wrong. And, you know, there's a difference, though, between being sorry and really repenting, huh? Right? I mean, a lot of times people are sorry because they got caught. But are we really sorry because we've offended a holy God? Whether you got caught or not, the truth is that God already knows what you did. He's watching. And as the scripture says, be sure your sin will find you out. It will find you out eventually. Everything will be revealed eventually. Everything that's hidden, everything, look, everything is naked and open. There's nothing hidden from God. Whatever it is in your life, you, you can't, you, you, you think you've got a room closed up for God not to see it? I, I was thinking about this. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I um, were talking the other day. Um, she was listening to Jay Vernon McGee, and I think he was talking about God coming by. Was that it? To see Abraham? And how, you know, <clears throat> they were angels. It was, it was the Lord, and he entertained them as guests. And I got to thinking about that. Wouldn't it be great to have Jesus stop at your house? You say, <gasps> well, if you're saved, he's already there. Okay? The question is this. How do you treat him? You know, when the guests come, you make sure the sheets are changed and you tidy up the bathroom and you make sure the towels are all clean and you make sure everything is spick and span, and, right? When you have guests come, right? Am I right, ladies? Am I right? Never mind. I know I'm right. I've watched my wife get the vacuum out again to vacuum it, you know, before the guests arrive. Why? Because you want it to be nice. You want it to be right. But l let me ask you something, okay? That's good for the guests to come. Okay, they came on Monday. But then they're going to come on, on Tuesday. All right? So you've got to clean it all up again. And then they're going to get back on Wednesday. You've got to clean it up all again. And every day they're coming back. Are you getting my point? <laughs> Listen, would you keep your house clean if Jesus was coming every day? How much would you work? Would you start complaining about that? Having guests every day. Well, listen, maybe Jesus shouldn't be like a guest. Maybe he should be like a permanent resident. You say, well, dirty towels will do then, huh? Really? Would they do? In your house, not that physical box you live in, but this house, do you treat Jesus like a guest or like a permanent resident? Anyhow, just a thought. He says, Now I rejoice, verse 9, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. There was change, a real change. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. 
For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold the self same thing. Now he's saying, you know, real repentance. When there's real change, you don't just give it up and go back. It isn't just a phony thing. Come to the altar, change for a week, change for a few moments, change so you feel good. And then as soon as that's off, that pressure, as soon as you quit thinking about it, you go back, you hit default. <laughs> you hit reset on the computer and you go right back, boop, to where you were. That's the old nature. Is there change? Is there difference? Okay, well, see a, see a preacher... How do you know, and this is, this is a good question, how do you know when there's real repentance? Well, you know, the funny thing is, he tells us right here, doesn't he? All right. What does it say? For behold, the selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. All right. Now here, following are the, is the evidence of repentance. Okay. What's the first thing? What, what? Sorry about that. What, what's the first thing? Carefulness. What carefulness? Uh, you know, the Bible says that, um, <clears throat> that we are to, to uh, not be caught up with care, but we are to be careful. What carefulness it wrought in you. In other words, the idea of being careful is, oh, this is something that's wrong. I am going to look out for it so that I don't, <clears throat> it's like, you know, it's, it's like one of those things where you pinch your finger and, uh, <clears throat> and you come back in the same place, the same, you know, it was a door that shut or it was a thing and you, you pinch it again. The next time you start thinking about it, don't you? You go, uh oh, wait a minute. I'll pinch my finger. It's like out there cutting brush. And there, there are th certain thorns you don't want to get a hold of. And so you, when you're cutting through, you're looking, okay, I have to be careful. I don't want to get snagged by that. Uh, a lot of other things. I mean, uh, well, I can't go there. But anyhow, careful, to be careful. I mean, a carefulness that says, it's like, um, <clears throat> it's like with your kids, you know, when they set their, you know, they set their drink on the edge of the table. All kids do that, right? They set it right in the edge of the table. I remember uh, there was a time when the boys were young, and uh, it seemed that we never had a meal that there wasn't somebody that spilled something, okay? It could be one of the kids, it could be one of the big kids, uh, but somebody spilled something, all right? We just kept a roll of towels, I think, by the table or a towel because you knew somebody was going to knock something over, dump something over. Anybody else have that experience? Never mind. Yeah, it happens all the time. So, carefulness. So, you, the, the kid puts the drink on the edge and you go, okay, that might not be a good idea. We're going to move that. You learn how to be careful Amen. to avoid something that is going to mess up the meal. But you learn it in other things. Um, I still remember, and my brother-in-law remind me about this <laughs> when, when he was back here, um, that um, we, um, he blamed me, but I don't think it was my fault. But anyhow, he had his, his dog had gotten shot by the um, hunters uh, in the gun club that was next to their house. And so they got out and got a new puppy for it, my, my mother-in-law and father-in-law. And so, um, and we happened at the time just to be living with them for about, what, a year and a half. And uh, one day uh, we decided to go to the, my, my father-in-law had a, a boat, small speedboat, and we decided to go to the, to the dam with the boat. And so we hooked it up. And that puppy had been tied to the tree, and it was right beside the driveway. And I walked by, and I saw, I saw the puppy, and he was, of course, straining against the, the rope, but he was out so that he was into the path of where the trailer was. And I thought, I stopped for a second, and I thought, I, that's not good. I need, I better, somebody ought to move him. Or, and I thought, 
I had to do it, but, you know, we were busy packing stuff in, getting it all together. So we got in the car, and I don't know why I was driving. I, I still don't know why I was driving. But anyhow, we got in the car, it was my father-in-law's car, and I put it in gear and drove about 15 feet and heard, yip! Yeah. That was the end of the puppy. And all I, I could do is get out and it kind of ruin the day. And all I could think of was, why didn't I move it? Why didn't I shorten the chain, shorten the rope? Why didn't I move the dog when I saw it? Be careful, huh? Aren't you glad for little backup cameras on cars now? For years, one of the things that scared me to death was I'd run over one of my grandkids or one of my kids. Careful. Carefulness. It could hurt somebody. What we're doing could be hurtful. Most of all that it hurts the Lord Jesus. Carefulness about things that, about whatever it is in our life. First thing. Secondly, it says, what is it? What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself. Now, you talk about clearing of yourself. It isn't that I, well, I'm not guilty of this. Uh, what it meant was they, they repented of it. They said, okay, we are not going to keep doing this. We are going to change it. And we're going to make it so that this isn't going to happen. We're not going to be guilty of doing this. We're going to clear ourselves. We're going to clear the deck so we don't have to deal with this problem. We're going to find a way to make sure that this is not going to creep in. They, made, they changed the way they had their services. They dealt with the sin of the man that was in the service. They dealt with the people that were suing one another as Christians. They dealt with, I mean, all those things that they talked about in 1 Corinthians. The immorality that was in the church. They dealt with it so that they could clear their testimony. So their testimony would be clean. So the world can come along and say, oh, you know, you're not much better than we are. And you, you go ahead and you just overlook all this sin. And, you know, how are you any different than the rest of us? God's people need to be different than the rest of the world. What else? Yea, what indignation. That's an interesting word, huh? The indignation wasn't directed at Paul. <laughs> yeah, that's what most people do. They get mad at the messenger. Amen. Their indignation was over their sin. Over the man, over the people who were getting involved in this. You know, some of the people weren't involved in the sin, but they were sitting there. And when they realized that there was a problem, they said, whoa, this can't happen. You know, we always need to stand up for truth and purity. Somebody needs to. We don't see it. It's not going to happen out in the world, okay? If God's people don't stand up for truth, who will do it? If we don't stand up for purity, you know, we're, we're so willing to accept the lesser standard. I preached about this a little bit on Wednesday night. The lesser standard, 99 and 44, 100% pure. You remember that? Now I ask on Wednesday night how many people don't know what I'm talking about. How many people don't know what I'm talking about when I use that term? Okay, little kids. Does anybody over 18 not know what I'm talking about when I say 99 and 44, 100% pure? What is that? Ivory soap, all right? And remember what they said, the two words after that? It floats. <laughs> that was the thing about ivory soap. You never had to look for it on the bottom of the bathtub. It always floated to the top. Do you understand that 99 and 44 and 100% may be good for the world, but it's not good enough for God's people? Would you want a Savior who was 99 and 44 100% pure? 
I mean, would you like Pilate to turn around and said, well, you know, I don't find any fault in him, except there is one thing. We don't have a Savior like that. To look for anything less is to be substandard. To God's standard. How important it is. How easy it is to just, you know, get along and be satisfied. Like Brother George used to say. You folks remember Brother George. How many of you? you know, yeah, there's only a couple people, few people here that remember Brother George Stewart now. We'd be working on a project, and we wouldn't have it exactly right, and somebody would say something about it, and he'd say, well, that blind guy riding down the other side of the road and the horse will never see it. It's a true statement. But, you know, Jesus walks around in here, and he sees it, doesn't he? He sees when we're willing to settle for us, It's a challenge to us, isn't it? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart, and see if there be all but a little bit wicked way in me. Is that what it says? What indignation! How can we let this happen? What vehement, yea, excuse me, yea, what fear. Now, by fear, he's talking about Awesome respect. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are a few people in Corinth that said, well, who does Paul think he is? Who does this guy think he is? Well, we know he was. He's the Apostle Paul. Yeah, go ahead and read half the New Testament. He wrote it. The Spirit of God thought he was good enough to write it. What do you think? Thought he was a vessel that could be used. God used him. He's the greatest, in my opinion, he's the greatest Christian that ever lived. I don't hear any objection to that, amen? amen. Do I hear an agreement? Do I hear any more agreements? Do I hear any more amens? Amen. What fear, what vehement desire. That idea of vehemence, to be so intense, we have to do this right. Oh, don't get so excited. Yeah, you can say that on what's not your money, right? It's like I used to tell you, mom used to say, I'd say something about the money or a problem I had, and she'd say, oh, Larry, it's only money. I'd say, yeah, until it's your money. Then it's a different story, huh? What vehement desire to do it God's way. Look, don't blame the messenger. He's just trying to tell you. But the reaction was, you know what? You're right. And we need to do this right. We need to make sure we live right. What vehement desire. I want to be like Jesus. I want to follow God's word. I want to be holy. I want to cleanse myself from all filthiness of the flesh. I want what he says in verse 1. I want to pursue the perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Sad thing is, there aren't many people in any generation that really want that. But you know what? If you're somebody that wants that, and God looks at your heart, recognizes your desire. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It's like Brother Dan preached about King David this morning. One thing you realize when you read the book of Psalms is how intense David was in his desire to live for God. And though he had some failures and weaknesses, he never gave up. He always had that humble spirit to come back to God. That's what Paul sees in these Corinthians, that humility of spirit that they were willing to seek that change. What revenge? What revenge? I, I thought that was an interesting word at the end there. What avenging? In other words, they, this, they set out to set things right. That's what an avenger does. OK? 
Okay, I, I know Hollywood stole that. Marvel Comics. But an Avenger sets things right. And they said, we're going to set things right and work to stay right. Work to keep them right. That, that's, an, that's an eternal vigilance. It's just like freedom in our country. It, it's an eternal quest. You have to stay at it. The same thing's true spiritually. This isn't the end of the story with Corinth. They had to keep on living day by day. Just like you do. And just like I do. And we're in a we're in a continual battle until Jesus comes again. Amen. Other people will stand in this place and declare, in this pulpit, and declare that. When this voice is gone, when this voice is silent, I pray that God will put in this place someone to keep declaring that. Holiness of God. Cleansing ourselves, even though we're not perfect ourselves. That we'll keep humbling ourselves before God. And Paul says that, look what he says in verse 15. He, he talks about Titus. He says, Titus came and, and he was really happy about what he heard. And in verse 13, he says, his spirit was refreshed by you all. It's nice to know that you refresh. Uh, one of the things that pe preachers say when they come here is, your people are easy to preach to. And we enjoyed it. Aren't you glad to hear that? I'm always glad to hear it. I thank the Lord for that. And then in verse 15, his inward affection is more abundant toward you. Hey, it's great to have affection toward God's servants, isn't it? They, Paul said, you know, I didn't come, but you sent, I sent Titus down there, and he came back and gave me a good report. And you know what? He's really happy with you guys. And, you, you know, you, you, you all are, are, you know, he's so glad for what he found out, and he can, he, can tra he can tell me about what happened down there, and he's praying for you, and he remembers how obedient you were, and how you, you received him with fear and trembling. You listened to what he said. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. You know, the greatest thing is to have confidence that God's people are going to keep trying to do the right thing. That's what I keep praying for. Confidence. Someone put that confidence in me one time. So tonight, we need to ask ourselves this. If God deals with you about something in your heart, what's true repentance? It's, it, it, you, follow that, you follow those, those guidelines. A carefulness. A fear and trembling an indignation about sin that shouldn't happen, a vehement desire to change. Why? Pursue holiness, to be separate, to cleanse ourselves of all filthiness and flesh. It needs to be our desire and our goal as we live every day. When you get up tomorrow morning, in fact, when you go to bed at night, tonight, this needs to be the goal. Be holy, for I am holy. That's all I've been trying to preach to you for 31 years. Okay? Come to Jesus. Be like Jesus. Know him and make him known. That's all it is. That's what we need to keep working at. Oh, Jesus, help us tonight to strive to be more like our Savior, to live for him and do his will. Thank you for these folks. Thank you for their patience. Thank you for listening for all these years over, over and over again to the message. Thank you for um, the truth that we've been able to preach. Thank you, Lord, for their willingness to let the word of God change their hearts. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to work and do that. And you continue to bless our ministry here and continue to bless what you've been doing for all these years. Lord, we give you all the glory and the praise. Thank you for the privilege of serving you. pray that you'll help us to keep moving ahead and doing your will. And I pray now that you would uh, bless us and help us. We're going to have a little business meeting here, and I just pray that, that it will be to honor and glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're gonna, we've got to do a couple business things. Real quick. And I'll tell you what, you all stand up. Let's go ahead and sing, all right? I'll let you all stand up. And then... Um,
All right, let's see. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord, and he gives us a mark. I saw the storm clouds dark in the sky or the heavenly trail. I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never fail. Okay, you can be seated. We, um, we, had, um, <clears throat> we haven't had a business meeting for a year, although we've done business along the way. So um, our Constitution says we're supposed to have uh, some kind of business meeting in the month of January. So uh, we want to give you a couple things. First of all, we need to call the meeting to order and have the minutes read by um, our secretary. So Joy's got to read the minutes. We're not recording now. <clears throat> 